Thanks, girl. I love it. All right, we follow an amazing God, don't we? I am so excited for today and that it is Easter. How many people love that? All right, what does that mean in your life? What does that mean to you? To follow a living God. And so for me, it means everything. Because before I came to faith in Christ, I had the scriptures. And I had them really backwards. I promise you. And when I came to Christ and my blindness was undone and I had that opened up to me, I saw a whole different world that I had never seen before. With a living God. A God of hope. It's amazing. And so, I don't know what Easter is to you, but to me, 1 Peter 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. See that I love about that? On Easter, as a pastor too, as long as I do what I'm supposed to do, I just have to tell you about Jesus. So it's a really easy job today too. Right? The question you have to discover along the way is what Jesus means to you. And how does that change you? And how does that make you different? How does that make you want to enter the world different? Those are things you got to figure out. So Easter, I love this. Easter is the annual celebration of Christ's resurrection to life after his crucifixion and death. So he is alive, right? For Easter, some, you know, for some people, it's a time of dying eggs, egg hunts. Right? Okay, if you guys don't know how the egg got in there, come talk to me later. It's a time to recite myth about the Easter Bunny. Right? So you want to make sure that, you know, if there is an egg in your backyard, it probably wasn't put there by an Easter Bunny. Right? Maybe the Cadbury egg, though. That's a good one. That's pretty impressive. Huh? So you can bring me those. I like those. Right? It's a time of giving candy, taking pictures. Um, what I do love about all holidays is it's a time of family. A time of getting together, a time of being with friends and loved It's a day to mark the spring for some people. Right? The flowers are coming, the tulips are up. Right? What does it mean to you, though? The true meaning of Easter is that the Son of God paid the price for our sins and rose again to reconcile us to God. So, what does that mean to you? So, for me, Easter is a moment of a remembrance in Christ. 2,000 years ago, a man died on the cross, was buried, and three days later rose again. And I'm telling you, I've gone through Scripture until I was blue in the face. Okay? I understand why the disciples went and hid. They missed it. They just didn't get it. They just didn't get it. Romans 4.25 talks about this idea of God reconciling us. Right? He who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. Easter means that our greatest enemy, death, has been beaten. Yes. What does that mean in your own life? Well, in my life as a Jewish person, I was trying to keep the law. Anybody know why? Trying to be that perfect person. Possibly trying to be the next Messiah. Definitely trying to be good enough so God would call on me. And after 19 years, I was like, <laughs> yeah, dude, you'll probably call my sister or somebody first. Trust me, there were better people to call on. So I walked away from my faith because I didn't think I could turn into the Messiah. Now, that's some serious blindness. That's where these guys were like, hey, can I take the cup? What are they talking about? Disciples had missed things. People had missed things because of blindness. Easter means our greatest, enemy, our greatest enemy, death, has been beaten. Easter means there's a way for our sins to be forgiven and a way to be made right with God. What does that mean to be made right with God? Can I fathom that? Is that even possible? In my Jewish mind, it was never possible. I just was really, really, truly, 100% resting on the fact that I had Jewish blood. And that I was going to be saved because of some statement that God made because I had Jewish blood. But really, I had to come to a, to a point where I had to make a decision on Christ. Why? Because he showed up to me. He showed up to me and said, I'm Jesus. What are you going to do with that? So Easter is a way for our sins to be forgiven. I love how my sister said early today, right? We follow a living God. Other faiths don't follow a living God. Okay? Even more than that, these other gods that they talk about, how many of them are willing to step into humanity, pay the penalty for your sins, 
right? Then prove that they're God. I mean, what a statement, raising again. And then he sits down at the right hand of God, which is really powerful. So what does Easter mean to you? That's kind of where we get into this, right? Easter means that the incomprehensible great power of God was on full display at the garden tomb where Christ lay. Get that? I'll read that again. Easter means that the incomprehensible great power of God was on full display at the garden tomb where Christ lay. The same great power that raised Christ from the dead now works in us. Think about that. The great power that raised Christ from the dead now it works in you. Ephesians 1, 18-23. Everybody turn there with me. I love this. I pray that these eyes on your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of his strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. He didn't even know there was a place there. Far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion. That's a pretty tall place. And every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And so somehow Christ in his great resurrection thinks that the church needs to be part of it has called us into this. Do you feel some honor in that? Do you feel some excitement in that? Do you feel some responsibility in that? What, are, what, what do you feel in your heart when you hear that the Lord wants you to be part of his family? That you are a part of his great inheritance? Do you think about that? What does it mean? Easter means the poor, in spirit, the poor in spirit will possess the kingdom of heaven. The mourners will be comforted. The meek will inherit the earth. The seekers of righteousness will be filled. The mercy will find mercy. And the pure in heart will see God. Matthew 5, 3 through 9. This is good. Because of Jesus Christ. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. The meaning of Easter is the promise of God came true in Christ. There's a hope. There's a blessing. Later on, I love this. Easter means that we proclaim good news to the poor. Freedom to the prisoners, right? Do you see the world that way? Do you see people shackled up? Do you see people shackled up? Luke 4, 18 through 19, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. How do you feel about this in your own life as the Spirit works in you? Think you're part of His dance? Think God wants you to be part of His plan? If He's called you, He's called you with a purpose. What does that look like? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to set free those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Do you know what it means when somebody says God's emancipation proclamation? Do you know what that means? I really challenge you. God's Emancipation Proclamation to be heralded far and wide. The good news is to be shared. Jesus Christ died on the cross. The good news, right? Emancipation. This idea of somebody coming in, substitutionary atonement, taking your place, fulfilling all the laws. It's a word that's so hard to fathom that I'm not sure sometimes that if anybody other than Jesus Christ could have even filled that word. But I do know, in the kingdom of God and God's plan, he was the only one that really was going to be the true one that could feel that. Because he is the only true Passover lamb. Perfect. Without blemish. Spotless. Flawless. God and man 
walking among us. Esau means that love is stronger than death. What does that mean in your own life? I always hear these verses. It was for love that God gave His only Son. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. When was the first time you heard John 3, 16 and 17? Remember? Remember? Well, here's how blindness works. Just so you know. First time I heard it was when I read it in John at 36 years old. You think a guy would hear that? Since then, I think it's on everything. It's on shoes, it's on walls, it's on posters, it's on football players, it's on... You can't fathom somebody wouldn't hear that verse. Can you? How does blindness really work? Well, when people aren't looking at the things that they need to be looking at, that's how blindness works. But I need to know that God did not send a son of the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And when I approach people, I need to let them know that God is the offering of salvation. Not judgment. Salvation. Love that saves. Again, it is for love that Christ died on the cross. Everybody turn with me to John 15, 13. We hear this verse a lot. But what does it really mean in our hearts? Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. So then we throw that in on Jesus, and he paid the price, and he died for us. Okay? But on our own lives, as we're examples of Jesus Christ, what does it mean for you to take time in your own life and lay down part of that for your friends? Lay down part of that for those around you. To be an example of Christ to the world. How powerful when you turn to somebody and say, Wow, I'll help you. Period. Okay? Knowing that you have some serious stuff on your plate to take care of. Okay? But that's okay. That can wait. Other things can come first. I had to wrestle with this in my own life. What comes first? What God wants or what you want? How many people have a full 90, 120 hour work week planned in their head having nothing to do with work? I mean, I could just, if I got seven months off, I'd probably build something or start something or do something. I have so many things I want to get to. Right? And then I come into my ministry life and I have so many things I want to get to. But I need to make sure I'm focused on Jesus Christ and what He wants me to get to. Because I need to know when it's time to lay down my life for my family, when it's time to protect myself, when it's time to do what He wants me to do. Because there's different seasons, right? But ultimately, we need to be looking at Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. How close are you walking with Him? That's one of the things that I am thankful for. So, out of my Jewish faith, I think I missed a lot of things about Jesus Christ because I just didn't see him in there. One of the overlapping things that really find powerful in my life that I think is really cool, God talks to Abraham, huh? God talks to Enoch, huh? Yeah, God talks to me. He talks to people. I believe that. I believed it my whole life. I believe he wants to talk with you and walk with you and interact with you just like that song talked about. If you don't believe that, come talk to me. Come walk with me and watch him walk with us. I promise you. It's because love of the risen Lord intercedes for his children. Everybody turn to Romans 8, 31 through 39. I didn't understand this stuff as I was growing up. What's then the, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Isn't that encouraging? Right? I didn't understand that. You read the Old Testament, you think God's against those guys sometimes. There goes the ark to the other dude. What's going on? You know what I mean? But this here is hope. Really believe that God is for us. Can't believe I didn't know God was always for me. I had to repent of that a lot as I came to faith. Right? To actually believe there's a God of the universe that may or may not be for you? No, it's just, He's for us. What then shall we say of these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him over for all of us. How will He not also with Him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather he who is raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. 
Get that? Right? If God is for you, who can be against you? If God's for you, he's up there going, I know that guy's weird. I know he doesn't say things right all the time. But man, he runs up and down the block telling people about me. Let him stay there. And God works that. He says that about each one of us. Right? We're broken. We're busted. But are you willing to be a broken, busted, used thing? Are you too busy wondering what the world is doing? I promise you this. I went and got my master's in theology, and there were tons and tons and tons astronomical Christians. Blows my mind. So many Christians that were smarter than me, more articulate than me, wrote better papers than me, but wouldn't stand here and say anything. So I guess here we go. I'll get up and talk. Apologize if I say it wrong. What I need you to know, though, is that I love the Lord. And He loves you. And that's the important thing. He's working all things to, to the good. Who is the one who, over, who condemns? Christ Jesus is He who died. Yes, rather, He who is raised, who is the right hand of God. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Just as written, for your sake we are being... Amen. And I thought about this. This is so powerful in my life. I probably right here would have told the story about how this was a real powerful verse to me when COVID first hit. Because I had to go out into it. Okay? I did a memorial. And this lady, bless her heart, her and other nurses, I never thought about this my whole life, but her and other nurses worked on a polio wing before they had a cure for polio. I'm like, goodness gracious. That's got to put some faith in the Lord to do that. Some serious faith. And they were getting it and promised they'd take care of each other. And I'm going, man, talking about loving one another, talking about God's love, talking about loving those around you, talking about understanding that no matter what happens, we need to kind of lean in and do the right thing. And we've got to trust in God. So it wouldn't be Easter if I didn't talk about why the resurrection is so important. First Corinthians, everybody turn there with me, start getting out ahead of me. The resurrection is so important for several reasons. First, like I mentioned earlier, it helps us be a witness to the immense power of God. Somehow in your mind, in all of our minds, right? Okay? We actually have some weird thought in humanity. This is why it's dangerous what's coming down the road. Okay? We all have this humanity thought that somebody somehow might be able to raise someone from the dead. That's what's dangerous if you look at the world around us because you're going to get prophets later where things happen and people are going to buy in. But somehow, humans somewhere have this weird, twisted, backwards thought that there might just be a chance that a human could do that. But not after you're dead. None of us really believe that we could undead ourselves. We might be able to undead somebody else, but not ourselves. This is what's so powerful about his resurrection. He did it himself. I don't know a better way to say it. I just, it's amazing. He I did it himself. It's unreal. And so it's beyond human comprehension. I don't know why we think somebody else could do that, or a doctor, or some machine, or whatever. But once I'm dead, to raise myself from the dead, that's beyond comprehension. And he steps in and he does this. And it's powerful. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 through 57. But when the perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal I will put on immortality, mortality then, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen, right? In resurrecting Jesus from the grave, God reminds us of his absolute sovereignty over life. God is sovereign over your life. We all have an appointed time. We all have an appointed day. And I believe we all have a plan that he wants to do with us in that time. You need to look at that. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is also important because it validates who Jesus claimed to be. God. The Messiah. Here's a couple verses, Matthew 16, 1 through 4, for those that like to see signs. The Pharisees and the Sadducees came up testing Jesus. They asked him to show them a sign from heaven, but he replied to them, 
When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, from the sky is red. In the morning there will be a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. Do you not know how to discern the appearance? Do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but cannot discern the signs of the times? And this is a really good one still to use in the world. If you're an evangelistic type person, every time you see a red sky, you can turn to somebody and goes, Red sky at night, sailor's delight. Red sky in the morning, sailor's warning. You know that's a Bible verse? Talks about how Jesus is going to come. An evil, adulterous generation seeks that kind of a sign. And, and, and a sign will not be given in it except the sign of Jonah. And he left them and went away. And so Jonah was in the belly for three days. And so that was it. He gave him a word. Did they want to buy into that? What does it take for you to really get fired up about the Lord? A word from Him? A thought from Him? Are you hearing Him? Sinless character, divine nature. Psalm 16, 8 through 11, I have set the Lord continually before me because He is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely. For you will not abandon my soul to Shoel, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy, and your right hand there are pleasures, right? This verse in 10, right? Psalm 16, 10. This is one of those I missed. This is one of those I missed. Nor will, your, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. I should have known that Jesus would have rose again. If he was the Messiah, right? One verse, right there. But blindness is blindness. Jesus never saw corruption even as, as he died. Amazing, perfect, spotless lamb. Acts 13, 30 through 37, but God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, the very ones who are now his witnesses to people. And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers, that God has fulfilled this promise to our children and that he raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm. You are my son, today I have begotten you. That's about Jesus. Oftentimes, when we read those psalms, we make that about ourselves. That's about Jesus in that spot. Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As for the fact that he raised him up from the dead, no longer to return to decay, he has spoken of this, when I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. I sure wish I would have read that verse too. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid among his fathers and underwent decay. But he who God raised did not undergo decay. It's really powerful. We follow a living God who is working in and around us in no other way that any human throughout history has ever been able to approach. Validates his deity. Validates who he is. Turn to me with Acts 17, 22. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that Christ had suffered and raised again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. Christ's resurrection is also authenticated in his own claims. This is why there was so much authenticating of his claims going on. People were struggling believing that he was deity. Struggling. Believing. They were following a living God. Ah, he's just somewhere. How close is God to you? And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Mark 9.31 says, For he was teaching his disciples and telling them the Son of Man is to believe it in his hands of men and they will kill him. And he will be, raised, he will be killed and raised on three days later. Same thought. Mark 10.32-34 They were on the road going up to Jerusalem and Jesus was walking on ahead of them and they were amazed and those who followed him were fearful. And again they took the twelve aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to him, saying, Behold, we are going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, and spit on his face, scourge on him, kill him, and three days later he will rise again. Missed. Scattering. 
at the cross. Just missed. If Jesus Christ is not resurrected, then we have no hope. I got hope. In fact, apart from Christ's resurrection, we have no Savior, no salvation, and no eternal life. Just everything's to be pitted, like the Apostle Paul says. Emptiness. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ had not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Your faith is also vain. Moreover, we have been found to be false witnesses of God, because we testify against God that He raised Christ, whom had not raised. In fact, the dead are not raised. For the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those also who fell asleep in Christ have perished. And if we have hope in Christ, in this life only, we are men to be most pitted. Good thing we get Jesus Christ talking about being the resurrection and the life. And this is kind of what we looked at in John, right, the last couple of weeks. 11, 25 through 26, Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me lives even if he dies. We get used to hearing that, though. What does that mean? Try dying to yourself a little bit. See what it means to truly live in Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 53-58, again, the idea of putting off the imperishable, the sting of death. Do you know what you have in Christ? More than He has just risen. The sting of death is gone. Eternal life with Him. Do you get fired up about that? Do you get excited about that? Do you have it? 1 Corinthians 15, 20, write this one down. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, and he is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. In other words, Jesus led the way, for, way in life after death. He's leading the way. He set a path. That's right, right out of the gate. You know, he's got to go. One greater than I is going to come, and here, here's this great commission. Go into the world. Tell the world about me. Tell them who I am. Baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go make disciples. What does that look in your life? I love Jesus. I love that He rose from the dead. So I hear this a lot. I love Him so much I'm willing to pick up the mission. He has a plan for your life. We're not all the same. We're all very unique. We don't want to all be the same. We're all going to reach a different group of people in a different way with our own awesome uniqueness. So if you're loud and say things weird, that's my weak uniqueness, my weakness. Maybe both. Okay, if you're quiet and whatever else, maybe that's your uniqueness or your weakness. Who knows? But man, the love from the Lord will come out of whatever one you are. And people need to see that first. They'll put up with the other stuff if they know how much you love the Lord. So how much do you love the Lord? And what has He done for you? So we're going to take this verse, Hebrews 10, 11 through 25, because this is where it pretty much hit me in the gut, what the Lord did for me, and it blows my mind. So I grew up in a Jewish home, and in a Jewish home, every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. I don't know why they even bothered. But... It's just what it was. That's my struggle. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sin for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting for that time onward until his enemies made footstool for his feet. But for by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws upon their heart. And on their minds I will write them. You know how lucky I feel to have God's law in my heart? To feel conviction? To feel the tug of the Spirit? I didn't really feel those the same way before I came to faith. I promise you I didn't. When you look at the world and you're like, how can they do that? They don't feel conviction the same way. Some people have a heart of stone, not a heart of flesh. There's a difference. Have grace. I will put my law upon their heart, and on their mind I will write them. He that says, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. 
Yeah, amen. Now where there's forgiveness of these things, there's no longer any offering for sin. And we get this really cool and new and living way. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated us through the veil that is his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let's draw near with sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and let our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who is promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembly together as in the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all more as you see the day drawing near. And so what does it mean to be able to boldly enter the throne room of God? My life. The guy that used to enter into the throne room was this high priest. Ultimately that became like a Pharisee guy had to tie ropes on, okay? And I'm just back here, I'm a baker, baking the bread. And I might be the luckiest way I can get in would be to maybe be lucky enough to make one of those loaves. I don't know, where were you, right? But then Jesus dies on the cross, and you can go like this. <laughs> and you can enter the throne room. And you can start appealing, and talking, and interacting. And my Christian brothers are like, what are you doing in there, dude? What are you doing in there? What are you doing in there? You don't have a rope on. You're not holy enough. You don't say things right. And I'm like, yeah, I know I don't. I know I don't, but he let me in. He let me in. And I understood this. So in 2006, I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I was a 25-year guy working in a bakery, wholesale, drinking problem, and the works. And God freed me from it. And I'm telling you, I'd look at that guy, I'd be like, dude, you're not qualified to do things for the Lord. I would, by standards, our standards. I'd be like, dude, you're not qualified. He'd look at me and go, I can't say what he'd say. He'd go, tell me to go fly a kite very kindly, because I'm going to do something for the Lord whether you like it or not. And then he'd look, he'd go, because he talks to me. I don't know how long I've had to say that. Is he talking to you? That's what we need to hear. I need people around me. I need people running with me. I need people who hear the Lord. I need people to tell me to settle down. I need to people to tell me to get excited. I need people to tell me everything in between. But nothing happens until we fully understand what Christ has done for you on the cross and what that means in your own life pouring out. Back to where we started. The true meaning of Easter, we follow living God. Why is the resurrection of Jesus Christ important? It proves who Jesus is. It demonstrates that God accepted Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf. It shows that God has the power to raise up from the dead. It guarantees that our bodies of those who believe in Christ will not remain dead, but will be resurrected unto eternal life. Here's the whole 1 Peter 3-9. through I don't know where you sit with the Lord right now today. I don't know if you believe in Him or if you don't. That's between you and the Lord, but it's very important between you and the Lord. Okay, where's your heart with the Lord? Our sins separated us from God. Jesus Christ paid the price on that to reconcile you to God and to have a relationship with you and to love you and to give you an inheritance. We should get excited about sharing this with people. So excited. I don't know how God's going to use you this week, but let him use your uniqueness to tell people that God is alive in your life. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. I get excited about that stuff, right? Who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. 
so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with a joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. You know, I wrestled with this verse for a long time right here. And though you have not seen him, you love him. I feel like I've seen God. But then i got to know I haven't really seen all of him. I haven't seen him in his fullness, the full deity of God, in his resurrected, crucified body. What does it mean to see him? So for now, we're given a taste of glory. A taste of him. If you have a taste of him, run. Follow him. Let him be your resurrected living king. Let's pray. Father God, we uh, love you so much. And Lord, we praise you for the work you're doing in our life. We praise you that we can follow a living God, one who is alive today, working in our lives and wants to work in, in us and through us and around us. And so, Lord, we continue to pray for divine appointments. We continue to pray to grow together and love one another fervently. Lord, I praise you for each and every one of us here in, in our own uniqueness, in our own differences, and the way that you use that. And so, Father God, I love you so much. Lord, I hope people find you today. Amen.